I want to say a word about the Policy School and the Dukakis Center and about Data Day, and then I'm going to turn it over to others who are uh, more, have been more involved than I have. Um, like every university and school of public policy in the country, um, we here at Northeastern do you know, a lot of research and we do a lot of education, and I hope today that some of you, many of you will get an opportunity to meet our wonderful students. Our policy school is really focused on training graduate students who are going to work in local and state government and at nonprofit organizations um, and really make a difference. And uh, so they've been very active in helping um, put this day together and they're around today to answer any questions and help you out. Um, but one thing that I think separates the, our School of Public Policy from others is a commitment to really engaging on policy issues, not just studying them, not just teaching them, but really engaging on them. And when we do, we do it in partnership with a lot of wonderful organizations, including the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and the Boston Foundation. And one of the reasons that we um, focus so much on engagement is, is that we're not in the business of doing policy for the sake of understanding policy. We're in the business of making change. And that's what Data Day is about, too. The most important part of the name isn't the data day, but it's the subtitle, which is really about driving change by making data available, more wi widely available to folks. Um, and that's, that's what I think is really important. Um, there are other ways we engage with the community, and one of the things, if you, if you have a great time today and you ever want to come back and visit us again and see what else we do, one of the other opportunities I would encourage you to take advantage of is for six years now, we've run a program called the Open Classroom. The Policy School has run a program called the Open Classroom. It's an actual graduate seminar. The students in it are getting credit. We open it to the public. This past semester, we had hundreds of people on campus for a semester-long course on climate um, change challenges and solution. This coming fall, um, three faculty members, including John Auerbach, the former public health commissioner for the state and for the city of Boston, are doing a course called Policy for a Healthy America. And it's Wednesday night. So hopefully, you'll have a great day today here at Northeastern, and you'll come back and visit us again for the open classroom or our other projects. I'm going to turn the podium over now to Mark Drazen, the head of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, the Dukaka Center uh, collaborates on a seemingly daily basis <laughs> with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council um, because we really do share this commitment to helping make people more empowered. Data Day is really, at the end of the day, not about data. and It's actually about you. It's about giving you the tools to find data, analyze data, present data, and then use that data to make change for the better in your communities. That's what we're about. That's what MAPC is about. That's what the Boston Foundation's Indicators Project's about, and that's what Data Day is about. So have a great Data Day, and here's Mark. Stephanie, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Dukakis Center at Northeastern University, which is the traditional venue. It's been long enough now that I can say it's a traditional venue for Data Day. And uh, it is really, it's wonderful to be here and see the room so full. This is a big room. And as a former politician, I endlessly worry about large rooms because I always say you should have a small room with an overflow crowd rather than a large room with any empty chairs. But we have hardly any empty chairs. There are a few up front in the usual way of such matters. The back seems completely full. The front still has some chairs. So if you're walking in or lingering or you'd like to be closer, please come up. There are some, some seats in the front. Uh, our collaboration with Northeastern University and particularly with the Dukaka Center is just fabulous. Uh, we work particularly in recent years on the issues of transportation finance, equitable transit-oriented development, and ways to encourage people to be able to get from place A to place B, to enjoy their lives, to earn a living, to be educated without having to worry about the transportation part of it. Uh, we truly believe that the economy and the quality of life in a region is deeply affected by the quality of the transportation system and by the equitable nature of that transportation system. And that is precisely the corner of the work that we've been doing with Stephanie and with the Dukaka Center. And we're really hopeful that in the course of the next couple of weeks, there will be one benefit that spins off from that effort, uh, which has been assisted by so many of you and the institutions you represent to pass a comprehensive transportation finance bill with a serious focus on transit 
in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It looks like we are maybe just a few days away from that accomplishment. And, and by the way, anyone who wants, who, who is even thinking of having someone get up and lecture and inform people about that process uh, just automatically speed dial Stephanie. I'm not sure there's anyone else that they speed dial these days because she's everywhere showing her wonderful work. Uh, our collaboration with Northeastern is one of our critical partnerships, but another really critical partnership is the one that we have had for many years with the Boston Foundation and with the Boston Indicators Project. And I'd like to talk about that for a moment if I could. The Boston Foundation has for many years been a thought leader and an opinion leader in addition to a foundation on a whole variety of critical issues. And one of those issues, which I was just reminded of yesterday as I was on the way home listening to the radio, um, was the importance of data in making sensible public policy decisions and in deciding upon the expenditure of public funds. Uh, you might have heard about a report that's been put out by two recent uh, alumni, uh, former managers of the uh, U.S. Office of Management and Budget. One a Democrat from the early years of the uh, Dukakis administration, Peter Orzak, and one a Republican from the prior Bush administration. And what they have been able to agree upon is that one of the difficulties with government programs is the fact that so few of them are based on an actual assessment of data, either as a determinant of need as a determinant of program design or as a measurement of whether or not the program actually succeeds. Sometimes we feel in our lives that we are awash in data, but the amount of data we have available is not necessarily consistent with whether or not we use that data to make decisions. One of the great accomplishments that's really been led by the Boston Foundation and by its indicators project is to channel the data to put it together in a comprehensible form, to make sure that people are able to access that data, and always to encourage those who are either advocating for public policy change or actually making public policy decisions to look at the numbers, ask what they mean, and inform their decisions based upon that information. That's one of the reasons, perhaps the major reason, that all of you are here today because you're all involved in determining the future of your community, the future of your city or town, the future of the Commonwealth. And if you come here, it means that you'd like some of those decisions to actually be based on the facts, which is an amazingly radical notion. So you're all radicals. I know you know that already. You don't need me to tell you that. But that is, in our society, an amazingly radical notion. And even though there will be, you know, fits and starts and it'll go up and it'll go down in the long run, I truly believe that if we make decisions about our public policies and our public expenditures based on data, they will by and large be better, they will serve more people, and the quality of life in our community will improve. So figuring out how to parse that information, how to understand it, and then how to apply it is really the mission of this day. We've typically done it once every two years, a generous, I hope I'm getting this right, a generous uh, donation from the Knight Foundation through the Boston Foundation has enabled us to do the event this year as well. And I immediately began referring to day-to-day -to -day as annual. And <laughs> Holly St. Clair, who, as you know, is right here and deserves a tremendous amount of credit for this day and runs our data services department at MAPC. immediately eliminated the word annual from my notes because she said, well, we need the money. So, you know, if we, if we don't get the money, we have to do once every two years. But our hope is, if we can, to make this more of an annual event. So I've spoken a little bit about the Boston Foundation, our partnership with them, and the Indicators Project. But really, for the last how many years, Charlotte, at Indicators? For the last 15 years, the driving force and the public face behind the Indicators Project has been my dear friend and our colleague, Charlotte Kahn. And I'd like to ask Charlotte to join me up here if she could.
So this is the first time that I have presented a career, sometimes people say lifetime, but we say career, and I want to explain why in a minute, a career achievement award to an individual whom I consider to be a contemporary of mine, and that is a frightening experience. <laughs> I met Charlotte for the first time in the community room of St. Patrick's Church in Roxbury. I do not remember the exact year, but I believe 84, okay, 1984. She remembers the meeting. She doesn't remember meeting me, I'm sure, but it was 1984. Uh, I was working, I think, for the city of Boston at that point in time, so I was the enemy. I was the man. Whatever the meeting was, was about, I'm sure I was the man. So, but I was there because I wasn't really comfortable with that appellation, so I, of course, went to the community meetings as often as I could. I do not remember what it was about, but I remember Charlotte. And since that time, I have, I have been blessed, truly blessed, as an individual, not just as a leader of MAPC, but as an individual, to be her colleague, her coworker, and her co-conspirator on so many activities, which I think uh, have made the city particularly, and also the region and the Commonwealth a better place, particularly a better place for people of low income or people who in other ways struggle uh, to make the day work on a daily basis. Uh, Charlotte has used her dedication to indicators and to data as a tool to improve people's lives. For her, it's never been about the numbers or the pictures or the charts or the graphs. It's always been about how we can use the information to make better public policies and to make better lives for people. And in doing that, one of the side benefits of all of this work has been two, I would mention, to inculcate the interest in and appreciation of data in so many opinion leaders around the Commonwealth, to make them think twice about that statement, oh, let's look at the numbers first and also to train so many uh, people who have come up in the field, learned about this work, become dedicated and devoted to it, and learn Charlotte's quiet but forceful techniques for getting people with more power than we have to listen to those numbers and adjust their perspectives as a result of that. Uh, she has given tremendous guidance to Holly, to our staff at Data Services, and to me. She was also, I might note, on the selection committee when I became director of MAPC, and that has earned her the right to lecture me on innumerable occasions since that time, and occasionally I've been less than, um, less than eager to accept her advice, but usually when I've gone home and I've rested for a while and I've had a chance to think about what she's had to say, I've recognized that it was a better course of action than the one that I may have uh, initially uh, chosen to go through. So it is truly my honor and my personal pleasure today to present this Career Achievement Award. And it is a Career Achievement Award because even though this phase of Charlotte's career may be at, a, at an end, as director of the Indicators Project at TPF, we know there are going to be numerous, some completely untold uh, accomplishments that she will be bringing to the Commonwealth and to the city still uh, now that she has more free time to do so. So let me present this to Charlotte. Thank you so much. so much. This is an, really a surprise. I, I didn't come here thinking that this would happen at all. Um, and I'm so pleased to see all of you here today. Um, for me, it's just so gratifying that something that Holly and I have been doing for she, fi our fifth uh, day to day um, 
you know, has, has filled the room, as, as Mark said. You know, one of the things that we've been writing about in our indicators report for many years now, because we completed our sixth in, uh, most recently, is the issue of uh, a generational shift and the importance of new leadership. So I realized a while ago that I was the oldest person at the Boston Foundation, save one person, and realized that it was time for me to peel myself off and let new leadership emerge. And I just want to say that I am so proud of um, the staff that I'm leaving. So Jessica and, and say, could you just stand, please? Anne Holly, St. Clair at MAPC. I mean, these are my closest colleagues. And I just am so proud of them and so confident that everything that I care about will, is in good hands and will be moving forward uh, so well. And to those of you with whom I've worked for many, many years, I see Mary Knassis and a number of people who are there really at the beginning of the Indicators Project, thank you for your contributions and your support. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I can get discouraged about whether people are really l using the data to make change, I mean, to drive policy. It, lately, I have to admit, I have been discouraged. So it's, it was very heartwarming for me to hear what Mark said about policymakers. He really is a policymaker in the best sense, first as a politician, now as head of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And, you know, we all just need to work harder to make sure that the policies that are developed and executed really do reflect the truth and, you know, uh, the facts, because it's so easy for people to cherry pick what they want and use it for ideological purposes and partisan purposes, which is where we are in this country. So it's up to all of us and all of you, now that I'm peeling myself off, a little overactive gardening. Um, be careful, those of you nearing retirement. Um, you know, it's up to all of us to really double down on helping people understand the importance of not just data, but the truth. So good luck. Um, you know, this country is sort of teetering, and it's, it, this work is really uh, important. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for very much for this award. Thank you. To stay up here. There's one more thing for you. Oh. OK? Thank you. And then we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce you. Ted, and then we're going to go over there and take a picture. OK? okay? Thank you very much, Charlotte. So I'm going to actually ask the, um, the panel to assemble. I believe I've been told that Charlotte and I have to take a photo. So um, uh, Ted McEnroe, the director of public relations at TBF, is going to lead a, a panel through a very exciting uh, discussion about the 68 Blocks Project, which I know many of you are familiar with, which I think is one of the best connections between data and journalism that I've seen in a long time. And so I'm going to ask Ted and his panelists to come up here uh, while we go down and uh, do our photo shoot. Thank you all very much and have a good day. When we get settled, I think we just leave this up. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Ted McEnroe. I'm the Director of Public Relations for the Boston Foundation. And um, while we get everybody settled and uh, they finish the photos over there, I, I did want to say that on behalf of the Foundation, too, we wanted to publicly say thanks to Charlotte for all of her work. Day-to-day uh, -day is just one of the many things that she's played such a key role in throughout her time at the Foundation and with the Boston Indicators Project. And the reality is that to list out all the things that she should be thankful for would force us to cancel the rest of this panel. So. Um, we're just going to leave it at uh, uh, a great thank you to Charlotte for all the work she's done. And we know because she keeps showing up at our offices that she's not going to disappear entirely. Um, and uh, we just wanted to say thank you as well. And now as she walks across the stage, we can give her another applause. Well, 
Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started with the panel. Uh, one thing we want to remind you of is the social media aspects. Um, as many of you, I can tell, uh, uh, do recall, we're, we're using the hashtag data day uh, on Twitter. There's also a board on the side here where you can watch the tweet stream uh, if, uh, if you so desire. So please tweet uh, frequently and uh, keep people going. I, know, I can also see on the stream there's a lot of folks who are following this, uh, this event who couldn't be here from uh, other conferences. They're watching the live the video feeds. Um, so uh, let's make sure we keep them well informed. There's also a Tumblr this year for the day-to-day uh, -day festivities. Uh, you can find it at daytodayboston.tumblr.com and we'll be updating with photos and other information about the conference as it goes on. There's also a lot of information already there about the workshops. And uh, just uh, you know, reminders, as the crowd uh, fills in, if you have a seat near you and you see a lot of people standing around, uh, please you know, feel free to flag them over, uh, give them an opportunity to sit down and uh, enjoy the festivities. Um, when we get to questions later on, there will be microphones uh, being run in the, uh, in the hallways here. Because we are live streaming everything, please, please, please wait um, until uh, you get a microphone in front of you when we get to the questions. And we'll talk more about that when we get a little farther along in the panel, but I want to get to the, uh, the keynote right now. Um, we're really fortunate this morning to be joined by uh, a number of members of the team that put together the Boston Globe's 68 Blocks, uh, which would, could be considered arguably one of the most talked about pieces of substantive journalism uh, in this city in the past few years. Um, one lesson that, uh, that you can also learn by looking up at our panel, and it is one uh, later on this afternoon we'll do a panel on uh, how to approach the media with stories. Um, one secret is um, try not to schedule them for panels at 9.30 in the morning. Um, but we will be joined by, uh, by more members of the team as we, as we go on here. Um, back in December, uh, the Globe published this series of front page stories on the challenges and the character of the Bowdoin Geneva section of Dorchester. And having worked in journalism for a lot of my career, I know firsthand that you know, most of the time if, if a news operation is talking about locations like Bowdoin Street, Holmes Avenue, Geneva Avenue, there's a pretty good chance that somewhere in the same sentence they're going to be saying a shooting, a stabbing, or police are looking for suspects. And instead of that kind of work, the Globe spent months of work pulling together an impressive number of stories and a vast amount of data to seek to deliver a deeper understanding of this neighborhood and its people. Um, and just for a point of reference here, I just was curious how many of the people in this audience um, have read the 68 Block series or paid close attention to it? It's a, it's a good mix. Um, and how many of folks uh, had a chance to really explore some of the great online features that were part of this? Again, a, again, a good mix. So people are out there. They're checking these things out. Well, when you did that, um, here are just some of the people you were taking in. And I'll start kind of going from closest to me to farthest away. Um, Chris Marstall is the creative technologist for the Boston Globe, working on experimental news technologies in one of the coolest places in journalism, the Globe Lab, which is the Globe's research and development group. And you don't think often about uh, journalistic organizations doing research and development. The Globe's making an investment there, and uh, I, I envy his job. Uh, next to him is Steve Wilmson. Uh, Steve is uh, the enterprise editor on the Globe's Metro desk. He oversees long form and news feature stories like the 68 Block series. Um, joining him is the one person on the panel who's not a member of the Globe staff. Father Richard Doc Conway is a Catholic priest and was a central figure in the 68 Block series, uh, working from his church, St. Peter's Church. Uh, we got to watch as he got out into the streets in what can only be described as a determined mission to connect with the people uh, of that community. And then to his left, Megan Irons is a features reporter for the Metro section, covering a range of issues from Boston's diverse neighborhoods and taking on a really uh, extensive and personal role in this series that we'll talk about in a little bit more. As you know from all of this, um, there's a ton of work that went into this and uh, hopefully if you haven't had a chance to yet, um, you'll take the opportunity uh, during uh, you know, during the next few weeks to go back and really look at this series. It's coming, as we come around to the summer again, the, some of the issues that came up uh, in this series really uh, begin to resonate again. You can look at the, you know, read the stories, interact with the graphics, look at the pictures, analyze the data, listen to the audio. Now there's an e-book, so there's plenty of ways you can get really involved in this. And we will be taking questions both here and online as part of the discussion, so as it goes on, um, if you are online and you want to send a question on Twitter, please use the hashtag day to day. And a great way to help me be able to spot it in the tweet stream will be able to put a queue right at the beginning of it. Um, and ideally, you could also just send it uh, to my account, at T. McEnroe, and I'll make sure I can see them there. Um, 
Before we get to the questions, though, we wanted to get a chance to learn more about the series and the approach for integrating data and these powerful stories together. And for anyone who hasn't had a chance to see the series, give you a sense of what it was all about. So why don't we start with uh, a quick video uh, that gives you an overview of the 68 Blocks series. They don't really know the people. For people who don't live there, the Dorchester neighborhood of Bowdoin, Geneva, is a place they may only know through headlines about murders and gang violence. And it is a violent neighborhood. In the last 25 years, Bowdoin, Geneva has had four times the number of shootings per capita than Boston as a whole. That has given the neighborhood a murder rate more than triple the city as a whole. But Bowdoin, Geneva is home to 13,000 people, and most would not choose to live anywhere else. Uh, I mean, it's not as bad as it may seem in the news. In 2012, five reporters and more than a dozen photographers, videographers, graphic artists, and data analysts immersed themselves for a year in the life of the neighborhood. Two reporters lived in an apartment on Mount Ida Road this summer. They walked the streets, they met the families that call Bowdoin, Geneva home, and they asked the question, why does violence persist here? You go to Draper Street, there is a gang up there. You go to Hamilton, there's a gang up there. You go to Holmes Ave, there is a gang up there. You go to Only Street, there is a gang up there. You go to Geneva, there is a gang. From May to September, there were more than a dozen shootings, most of which did not make the evening news. The, the young kids, they got very bad attitudes. But violence is only half the story. What I like about the neighborhood is that it's actually a family neighborhood. The Globe's reporters saw that Bowdoin, Geneva is also a neighborhood of close-knit families and long traditions. It's a neighborhood of street-wide barbecues, <laughs> nighttime basketball leagues, One, two, three, bust the heat. and citizens united in an effort to end the violence. Neighbors in Bowdoin, Geneva know each other and watch out for each other. There's an almost old-fashioned sense of community here. A closeness that doesn't always exist in U.S. cities anymore. Bowdoin, Geneva is a beautiful, family-oriented neighborhood. We're trying. We're trying so hard. Has come a long way. It's a great place. I love living here. The place where I have family and friends. What Bowdoin Street means to me is home. And uh, with that, I'm happy to turn things over to the man who narrated that video, Steve Wilson. <laughs> it's my second career. Um, thank you for having us here. It's, uh, it's an honor and a delight for us to talk about this project. Uh, the reporters involved uh, and the entire team put an immense amount of effort into something that uh, felt like it was uh, special from the start. So we embarked on this project in the fall of 2011 after a murder of a 16-year-old kid on Geneva Avenue. He had been walking with his 14-year-old friend to the drugstore when another boy on a bicycle pedaled over to them, pulled a 40 caliber gun out of his waistband, and shot him dead. 14-year-old boy was injured but didn't die. The shooting was shocking because of the victim's ages, but it was also sort of numbingly familiar. We did what we always do. We sent a reporter out to cover the story, and we did one. But our Metro editor, Jen Peter, got a number of us together, and uh, we all agreed that it felt unsatisfying. There had been 24, 25 shootings in Bowdoin, Geneva alone already that year. And the fact is that year after year, it's a drumbeat of numbing violence 
that after a while you don't really pay attention to. Bowdoin Geneva addresses came across the newsroom scanners time after time after time, and after a while you only pick a few to cover. But we sat down and wanted to ask ourselves, there must be something more that we can do. There must be some way to understand this better. There must be some way to pierce the veil of preconceptions and shorthand that goes so often into reporting on violence, particularly in urban neighborhoods. Now, it wasn't like we hadn't made efforts in that direction before. There have been many times, even on daily stories, when we've done imaginative hard work to try to dig down into nuances. We'd spent uh, you know, weeks on a particular block or street where a shooting had occurred. But it, all of that always came back feeling unsatisfying, like we just didn't get very far. So the first thing we did was make an investment, not really knowing that we were doing, make a decision to invest in something big and meaningful. Now we had to come up with the way that we were going to do it. There's a mountain of work by newspapers, by academic researchers, by all kinds of people about urban violence. Were we really thinking we were going to do something new? So we ultimately decided, after a lot of uh, hand-wringing and uh, worry, we decided that the best thing that we could do was go in without preconceptions, without any preconceived ideas, and start from the bottom and tell stories. And we decided that we would do not just word stories, but visual stories, data stories. We would find every means at our disposal to tell a different story, to provide a different angle from which to view the same problem. What we ended up with, uh, we hoped, would be something that would, through the combination of all these different angles, through the notion of letting somehow people through social media depict their own neighborhood, to give video cameras to, uh, to kids to film their own neighborhood, by using data in many different ways, including the deep history of the physical place. We hoped that by putting all of those things together that we would emerge with a complex, nuanced picture that was truer than anything that we could do with any one means. So we sent out a, um, uh, we rented an apartment in the neighborhood. We sent out a newsroom-wide memo pleading for used furniture. Uh, we got a truck, we put up blinds, and uh, Akila Johnson and Megan Irons, who uh, is not yet here, uh, moved in. And they spent uh, the summer starting in May through September being as close as they could be to the neighborhood and to the residents of that place. So I'm going to ask uh, Akila to jump in here okay. with that experience. Um, feel free to tweet what I'm saying at AKJohnson1922 since we are <laughs> live streaming and live tweeting this event. Um, so as Steve said, I spent all of last summer, and I can't believe it's been a year already, living in the Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood. Um, we lived on Mount Ida Road, which some people refer to as Meeting House Hill, uh, from May through September. And um, for me, I, I'm, I'm relatively new to the city of Boston. I uh, have been here two and a half years, so at that point I'd been here about a year and a half. And I didn't really know a lot about specifically Bowdoin Geneva, but I was familiar with neighborhoods like Bowdoin Geneva because I've been a reporter for a while. And um, for me, the interesting thing about the project was that quite often when we go into um, communities of color and communities where violence seems to persist, there's a very common narrative, but we all know that no one exists in one way. No one is just one thing. Nothing is good, nothing is just bad. And so I kind of hate that binary good, bad, um, positive, negative, good stories, bad stories type of uh, way to tell a story. So this was a chance to really tell the story of a neighborhood and of its people in a very three-dimensional way. And so that was very, um, and my roomie just arrived, uh, <laughs> Megan Irons, this is my, and Q you saw on the video, that was our third roommate that we didn't mention, uh, the poodle. Um, so it was a way to really tell the story of a neighborhood in a very three-dimensional way, to, to really kind of get at 
the lives of people. Um, and in doing that, you know, this is, this is obviously a data day, so we'll talk about the data and, and kind of what went into helping to flesh um, the stories of the people out through the numbers. But our job is really to, to get to know the people in the neighborhood, to get to know their joys, their sorrows, their triumphs, their hopes. And that happened in a very organic way, and it happened in a way that doesn't happen in my own neighborhood. Um, I know the people, or I got to know the people in the triple-decker where we lived much more intimately than I know the people who currently live in my triple-decker. I have new neighbors on the second floor, and I have no idea who they are, but I can tell you just about everything, not just about, but I can tell you um, very real details about the folks that we shared a triple-decker with on Mount Ida Road. I can tell you about Chiquette and her children on the first floor. I can tell you about the home health care aid on the second floor and her children who also worked um, doing hair. And so these were the faces for the numbers that we, we see. You know, we, we went out and we bombarded the city with a very vast public records request because the idea was kind of, um, if the idea came to us, is there a number attached to it? Schools, let's get as much education data as possible. Homes, let's get as much rental foreclosure data, data as possible. Um, roads and, and street sweeping, oh, let's go out to you know public works officials and see if we can pull as much data as possible from them. And obviously, um, the information regarding shootings and, and violence, and so we, kind of got met with a bunch of deer in the headlights looks when we started approaching people asking for all of this information going back for as long and as possible as we could have it. But it was important to not just um, quantify it, but we, to qual we, we didn't just want to tell stories. We wanted to show that there was some quantifiable data to back this up, right? And so we were putting faces with, with numbers. And so for me, um, it was a very rewarding experience. It was also a very, um, it was hard. It was a lot harder than I think any of us thought it would be because these became our neighbors. They were our neighbors. They were no longer just um, sources that you go, you talk to for, I don't know, an hour maybe. Someone opens the door and then you leave. These are people that I, you know, I saw Doc at church. I went to church at, every Sunday um, yeah, at St. Peter. <laughs> I, I wrote it down. <laughs> I, you know, so I, I got to know the folks in church. I got to know Doc that way. I would see not just him, but other people. Then at Ashley's on Sunday morning after service, or walking up to, um, you know, the grocery store, the America's Food Basket, or the Walgreens on the corner. Um, so you, you get to know the people that you're reporting about, and they are no longer just um, someone who blesses you with an hour of their time, but they're someone who blesses you with three months of their lives. And so that is really, um, for me anyways, what was one of the most rewarding parts and challenging parts of that, because then you have a huge responsibility to do justice to that story. And we always try to do justice to um, and honor the stories that we tell, but this is a much more intimate situation. So because of the relationships that were formed, there was a bigger sense of responsibility and a bigger burden was placed on us to tell as complete a story as possible. And so for those folks who haven't um, spent some time with a project online, I highly recommend that you do that because that is really a way to um, kind of immerse yourself in that experience. And so you can play with various graphs online. I have my exploding peas here. Play with various graphs online um, that show the numbers. There, We did a survey with uh, students. We conducted an original survey with, with kids in the neighborhood. So you can spend some time with uh, the survey questions and their results. We've got um, Instagram, which is one of the, my favorite features of the project, where we were able to go through, through, and Chris will talk about this a little bit later, but kind of select Instagram photos that gave a representation of the neighborhood and then interview the people who, who, whose inter Instagram's photos we were using, and they were able to give us snippets of the backstory for that. So it wasn't just us telling people's story, it was also um, very empowering for us to provide a vehicle for people in the neighborhood to be able to tell their own stories as, as well. So um, that is kind of a little bit of, of what we did. And I spent the majority of, um, so it was kind of a two strand process. We had the experience of living in the neighborhood and then we also had um, like the reporting, right? So we immersed ourselves in the lives of some very specific people. Um, Maria Kramer, who will be coming later, immersed herself in Doc's life for as, as much as he would let us immerse. <laughs> and um, I spent my... Fun was <laughs> I, I spent my summer um, with 
Teresa Johnson and her children. And I, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you um, the beauty of the relationship that was formed because it's, it, it, we were kind of, it was beautiful and then a little um, frustrating. It was like the summer of negotiation because here I am asking her um, not just questions, but if I can witness these moments with her. So, oh, you have to go to your cousin's wedding? Can I come? Oh, um, you have to go to your best friend's baby shower? Can I come? Oh, it's Jalene, her, her now 14-year-old. Um, she's walking to summer camp for the first time by herself. Can I come? And then explaining to a 14-year-old why I can't drive her, but I have to walk along with her <laughs> in the summer as she goes to camp. And I kept, she, she would just give me this puzzling look, go, but you have a car. And I'm like, I know, sweetheart, but I need to experience this with you. Um, <laughs> And so th there was a lot of a lot of those moments, um, a lot of you know her son slamming doors in my face sometimes when I would come over. She, her one son in particular, he would just kind of roll his eyes if he opened the door, um, and would go in the back room. One of her sons at the time was um, in jail. He was in South Bay, and so I went and saw him at least once a month in South Bay. And I also went and saw him. He had an ongoing and open court case. So I was there every time he was in court. So I would see him about um, twice a month as well. And it was, it's very interesting that I'm seeing her son and interacting with her son more than she is because she is a single working mother and is unable to go to South Bay on a very regular basis or to take time off of work for a status hearings for his, um, his court case, which three weeks ago he was found not guilty on all three of his gun charges from that open case. Um, so. So our reporting, and I say that to say our reporting didn't stop either. Once December came and the stories were published, it wasn't like, thank you so long, it's been real. Um, I keep in touch with folks. You know, I still call Doc, I still speak to Teresa. Um, her family's recently gone through a very traumatic event and she called to tell me about it. And we've been talking about it daily um, and texting about it daily. So it was a very, it was a very, um, it was a very intense experience, not just for us, but for, I'm sure, the people who we were kind of stalking. Um, and there's really no other way to say it, because you, you're texting, you're calling, you're showing up, you're at their jobs, you're at their homes, you're going to the grocery store with them, you're going to the movies with them. Um, you, for all intents and purposes, on some level, while you were becoming part of their life, you still weren't part of their life, and you still had a responsibility then as people start to let that guard down, which is the sweet spot and where we want it to be, um, to realize when people would sometimes, I mean, she would just say things, and I just quite often would think, I can't believe she just told me that. Um, you know, I know things about her that her kids don't know. I know things about her that her mother doesn't know, just because these are those kind of intimate relationships that you form with people. Um, and so then the onus is on us to do justice to that story. Mm -hmm. so, Megan? Or, uh, I, I actually, I think that's an uh, interesting point because when all of our reporters uh, embarked on this, um, I sat in the office and said, now I want you to go out and uh, find people who are interesting to write about and spend every minute with them. <laughs> well, easy for me to say. <laughs> It turns out that um, that's a difficult proposition in any situation. Um, people are rightfully guarded about their own privacy and about the things that most matter to them. In this neighborhood, I think that we found an even more complex dynamic. Um, we, were, we represented an institution from the outside uh, that didn't understand this neighborhood. Yeah. And uh, we represented a world outside that didn't understand this neighborhood. And it took months and months to win even the beginnings of trust. Uh, Megan, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experience. Yeah, I think on that. someone said, um, I mean, this community and a lot of communities that are dealing with violence, violence on a regular basis, um, tend to look at the media as people coming into their neighborhood to chronicle their grief. We see them crying. We, we catch pictures of them at the funeral. We, we write about their dead one's dreams. Um, he was on his way to college. He was a good kid. And then we disappear. And they don't see us again. So it was very, very difficult, I think, to come back to someone and say, we're going to be here. Uh, and we're not just going to be here. Uh, after the funeral. We're not going to be here 
uh, till the weekend. We're going to be here the entire time. And that was very, very hard to communicate to folks. And even when you say it, and you say it over and over and over and over, it just did not resonate with people. And, um, and I remember at one point, um, I met the Davises in March. I think it was February or March. I'm not sure. And I told them what I, was, what I wanted to do. I wanted to document your life. I had no idea what that meant. I, I didn't know at the time that I met them that they were grieving over the loss of their son and that the murder trial was coming up in June. And that, that grief had not faded. They were still in the throes of it, really, in the grips of it. And in the middle of all of this, their son, the son who survived, the son who had watched his brother die, um, decided that he had to protect himself and arm himself with a gun, and he was caught doing that. So they were dealing with the fact that he's also going to spend some time in jail. And in a sense, they felt like they lost both of their sons. Um, I had no idea that was going to happen when I rung the doorbell that March afternoon and said, can I spend time with you? And I don't think they even knew what that actually meant, that it meant day after day after day, um, sometimes sitting on your front porch, calling you, um, waiting for you, being there with you. I don't think they, they really comprehended what that would take, and I give them so much um, a credit for that because we, we demanded some, we, Demand is such a strong word, but we asked so much of them. You know, we're asking them to tell us what they're feeling in the moment that they're feeling, and they're not even sure what they were feeling at the time that they were feeling it. So, I was with the Davis family. I was with uh, them through this very, very uh, difficult period of their lives. Through little Nate's, uh, um, I was in court when he pleaded guilty to the gun charge. I was with them when uh, they uh, went to the uh, to trial uh, for the killers of their son. And I was waiting for them to go to the cemetery where they would, because I think in a lot of these communities too, it's very hard for families to go back to the cemeteries and um, visit their loved ones. You know, the, the grief is so strong. And there were moments when the Davises just didn't want to deal with me, you know. Uh, um, Trina, especially when we first uh, had interest in this, we thought she was the strongest. She was extreme. She is extremely articulate. She is very precise about how she feels, and um, and so we thought we would go through her and tell the story through her. And this is a story that I feel like doesn't often get told. What happens when the person is dead and buried, and the families have to go back? on with their life? And how does that contribute to the, the community as a whole? How does that contribute to the cycle of violence that we see? And um, so, you know, things were going fine. I was lining up appointments. You know, I was introducing her to our team um, of photographers and videographers. And, and then right around Mother's Day, she had planned to um, march at a peace rally. And then she got up that morning, and it, the whole world just collapsed. She just didn't want to get up. She didn't want to do anything. And she didn't want to deal with me. So um, I remember having this very difficult conversation with her. Um, I was introducing her to our photographer, Yoon Bien. And, um, and she said, what more do you want? You know, what more do you want from me? I, I've, I've already given you everything. You know, And at that point, I realized that it was going to be one of those negotiating kind of things where it was the summer we, of negotiation. <laughs> we, you, you want you, you want their story, but you don't want to. You, you want as much as they can give you, you know. And a lot of people, there's a lot behind what they can give you. There's a lot of things you can open up that they don't want to deal with. Um, and then she said, "I can't do this. You know, I'm already dealing with my." My, my son, the anniversary is coming up. My, my other son is, may have to testify in this trial. I just can't. I can't do this. Um, and so that was, you know, for a reporter uh, who kind of felt that we were onto something, that we were on the inside of someone 
looking out. It was, it was very, it was kind of like, what am I gonna tell my editor? You know, it was kind of like, oh my God, no, this is all falling apart. But we found a way to tell the story of this family anyway because her husband, Big Nate, was willing to talk and he also had a story. And he had a story uh, that we don't often see. And that, that's of a father who, um, who's, who was there. He, he wasn't perfect and he had his issues and he had his you know, life uh, you know, with crime and overcoming them. And, but he was there for his boys. And um, we were able to uh, use him to tell the stories. And I remember going to court with them. I was the only person in the courtroom um, beyond the family. Um, for those three weeks. And um, well, the first day he comes in and he really wanted to tell the story. You know, he really felt that that message needed to be out there for other families, for other people who are looking at this issue and trying to figure out what do we do? How do we stop this from occurring? How, well, how do we not get guns to kids? How do we keep our boys alive? And um, he looked there was one point in the, in the courtroom when there was a break and we were in a little uh, hallway and he said to me, okay, Trina is not, you know, when you see her, just don't say anything, pretend you're not there. And I think that's one of the key things I learned over the summer. Half the time, the best things that I got were things when I pretended I wasn't there. They knew I was a reporter, they knew I was here for information, but the, the, the point is not to intrude, it's just to stand back and document, you know, and, and, and then come back to them sometimes and, and ask them. It was, it was really difficult, I have to say, Steve, that we, um, we were able, uh, as time got on, to become so familiar with the family and um, with the people on the street. They knew who I was, they knew who Yoon was. Oftentimes they thought he was the video guy and he was selling videos. Um, but this was a very difficult story. It was a very sad and emotional story. And I sort of felt like even though you're, you know, you're supposed to be a reporter and you're supposed to be objective and stand back, that you kind of get pulled into that grief and you realize it's never ending. And it, I think one of the things I learned coming out of this is that we all sort of have uh, preconceived notions about how to fix things, you know, you know, if we better education, give them a job, you know, if we do this or if we do that, but it's very, very complicated and oftentimes it's very, very personal. And I, I think trying to unravel all of that was very difficult. At the end of the day, I felt we realized that, you know, uh, the, the issue of violence, the issue of understanding a neighborhood and all its complexity is extremely complex to figure out. Megan touched on a point too. It just wasn't us asking for access. It was Megan and I asking could we come with a photographer and a videographer um, and then sometimes could you get a follow-up call from um, whatever kind of technician who may be doing something. So, so it was like the institution of the Globe who, who was coming. And so that's why we called it the Summer of Negotiation for Access, because we just weren't asking to be there, but we were asking to bring with us like all of these people. Like, you know, Doc just didn't spend time with Maria, but she spent time with Bill Green, photographer. And, you know, I mean, I mean, he can talk about what that was like, just having the institution kind of of the Globe. And as much as we try to um, shrink ourselves down in a way because we don't want to be seen. We do very much want to be the fly on the wall. Our sweet spot was when people forgot we were in the room. Um, it's hard to forget that you're in a room when I've got a notebook, I've got a pen, the photographer has a camera, um, the videographer is there with a, with, a, with a video camera and there's like three people staring at you documenting everything and that you're doing and saying. Um, so we quickly had to learn sometimes it could just be a reporter, sometimes it could just be a reporter and a photographer, sometimes if it was a reporter, like for me, um, I quite often wouldn't pull out my notebook. I took notes on the back of most, like when I was in mass, I took notes on the back of the programs. 
um, or I would use my cell phone, not in church, um, to, <laughs> um, to document what, what people are saying. People are okay with you taking a photo of them or video, you know, maybe taking a quick video snippet of what they're doing just because these pieces of technology have just become so ingrained in how we live our lives. So they're okay with a rude texter sitting next to them looking like you're texting as opposed to a reporter, even though they know I'm a reporter and they know I'm documenting everything they're saying. It was just easier for me and for them to allow me to be in their space and do that sometimes without my notebook, without my notebook out in their face. So you kind of have to figure out these ways to, to shrink yourself down in a way so that you're not taking up so much space in the room. Sitting next to me is uh, Father Doc Conway. Um, we had in the word story, uh, and there were a lot of words, um, we had five principal characters, uh, and Doc Conway was one. He, uh, St. Peter Church is uh, a cornerstone of the community. Doc Conway is a cornerstone of the church. He's also a remarkable individual in that he is out virtually every single day walking the streets. Um, We've been talking about access from a uh, journalistic point of view, but he's made it uh, a life's effort to know the people on the streets, understand their problems, and, um, and try to get to the heart of violence. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, your life and work there. First thing I would say is if someone from the globe approaches you and says, can we follow you today? Say no, because you'll be stalked. You talk about stalking. You turn around, you hit somebody uh, in the face while they're holding a camera. Or a, oh, anyhow. You saw the little video, and one of the things in that video was a block party at the end of Norton Street. And uh, the, the big, big man there is what they've talked about. Big Nate. And, uh, Big Nate is there organizing the dance. Uh, the block party was organized by a man we called in the story Tal. Tal, to you, would be a gangbanger in the city of Boston. He's considered an impact player. These are the people that drive the violence. He wanted to organize the party to bring the street together, which he did. And uh, so the police were good. They overlooked a few things, uh, a lot of things. And uh, uh, this particular tell was the target of a, a shooting on the 4th of July uh, a year ago, two years ago now. And it was right there, right in that video that you saw. And they missed him, and they got his cousin. So. He's a target still, and yet he's trying to bring the neighborhood together. And um, you know, this, this whole story, I think, 68 blocks, is a lot about people trying to make changes, trying to improve their lives. You see there about, uh, in the video, people saying, I love this neighborhood, and one of the other reporters that was there, I spoke to her at the uh, garden thing. Jenna says, you know, I'm really going to miss this neighborhood. You get so close to these folks, right? Um, so that's uh, Big Nate. And uh, Big Nate's son, as you know, was shot. He was not the target. Little Nate was the target. They got the wrong kid. Huh? So this is why little Nate realizes he has to protect himself. So he gets the gun, he gets caught, he's in jail. So I visited him in jail and uh, asked how he was doing. Well, South Bay is, is really divided by gangs, so he's had his issues at South Bay. He's out now and uh, looking for a job. Um, he's so right? He got a job. I gave him the list of the construction oh, ones. Good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Gotta be careful. Some jobs are no good if you can't be Corey cleared, right? Or if you have a felony, you know. So this, this should work out for him. I said, well, what are you gonna do when you get out? And he said, well, uh, he was gonna go down south to live with relatives down there. 
And um, I said, great idea, you know, get out of the neighborhood. He said, but I've had some problems in here with the gang things. He said, I have to settle a few issues before I move. I said, geez, Nate, come on, come on. Forget that, get out of town. I'll give you the ticket, anything, but get away. Uh, and this is, to me, how do you, how do you break through uh, th th this gang thing that goes on for years and years? The Mendez brothers started the whole thing, and it turned out, it was a year or so ago, it was a cousin they finally caught up with that killed his own cousin, and this started to drive the whole business of, of the gangs, and uh, it, it's ongoing. And, um, we see now that uh, th there's a new gang. They haven't come up to Bowdoin, Geneva yet that we know of. They're 14-year-olds. They're carrying guns. And uh, it, it, you know, how do we prevent this from happening? Uh, we have a great teen center right there. And uh, Catholic Charities, they do a great job. But they're running out of funding. And they wanted to cancel the middle school program. That's where we have to be, you know. Middle school is where we have to get these kids, in, in my opinion, deal with the kids, deal with the families, um, school issues, all those things. And I think you know that, you know, because you don't have neighborhood schools anymore, you could have a mother who's supposed to go to parent-teacher meetings in different parts of the city, because the two kids may be in different schools. She's a single mom. She's working probably two jobs. Cape Verdean people are very industrious. There's no way she's going to get to those meetings. T can I tell one quick? <laughs> I have a brother living in New Hampshire, and he's six kids. He's retired now. His oldest daughter was a math teacher. Uh, but when she was in high school, my brother said, I'd be sitting with her at the, at the dining room table at night helping her with geometry. I said, Jim, she's a math teacher. Yeah, I know she's a math teacher, but she struggled with geometry. And she would be in tears as I tried to help her with geometry. I said to him, you know, people in Bowdoin, Geneva, they can't do that. They may not speak English. They may not have gone to school or went as far as fourth, fifth grade. Or they never took geometry. Or they're not there. They're working. And there's too many other kids to take care of. So trying to get parents involved, and I'm sure you saw this, um, very, very challenging. Very challenging. So. Uh, I wonder if we could um, take a look at a couple of the gizmos we got here. Um, Ted earlier alluded to the. Uh, to the lab, what are we calling? Globe Lab. Globe Lab. <laughs> um, you need to understand that uh, we work in a sort of sprawling building um, that was once filled with a lot more people than it is now. Um, the, uh, some years ago, it became noticeable that the very enormous classified advertising department was getting thinner and thinner, and pretty soon there was nobody left. Um, so they cleaned that place out. Uh, you may have noticed we don't have classified ads anymore. <laughs> um, they cleaned that place out, and uh, they really slicked it up, I have to say. Um, the newsroom, if you've never been in one, is an ugly, gritty place that is uh, sort of beige and stacked with old newspapers and files that reporters can't bear to throw away. Um, the lab, uh, they have music playing. They've got cool carpet. They have cool furniture. <laughs> yep. And like Chris, they just look cool. <laughs> uh, so on this project, we recognized pretty early that uh, it was going to be, um, this was going to be, we felt like we wanted to be pioneering and work very closely with these guys um, to come up with for Sorry to use the word so much, but there's no better one with you know cool things. Uh, so I mean, as I said earlier, we really wanted to experiment with ways that we could tell different kinds of stories, and uh, Chris can show us a couple of those here. Hi. So um, 
you know, one of the things that we think about as a kind of core competency for the lab is, is uh, you know, new publishing technologies. Uh, in 2012, that means 2013, a lot of that means social media, um, obviously Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Vine, whatever it is. Um, so when we're asked to think about um, how we could contribute to a story like this, we thought about um, one thing is, you know, we're embedding ourselves in this community, uh, in, in the physical community. Um, are there ways that we can embed ourselves in the virtual community as well? Um, and so we looked at um, a lot of different social networks and how they were being used in the community. We looked at uh, Twitter, uh, we looked at YouTube, um, and uh, we found a lot of cool stuff on both of those um, services. Um, we looked at pl places like thisis50.com, kind of you know vertical networks. Um, uh, we, f we felt like Instagram uh, offered uh, a really, really unique uh, perspective on the community. Um, first of all, Instagram is uh, um, pretty, very widely used in the community, as it is in pretty much across Boston. Um, th this is, of course, going back about a year and a half. Um, so uh, Instagram take up uh, was not quite what it is today. A lot of people still hadn't heard about it, but it was being used pretty heavily in Bowdoin, Geneva. Um, and uh, another thing is that when you um, when you use Instagram, you're always talking about the place that you're in. When you're tweeting, you might be talking about something that's you know in another country, uh, but Instagram is really about where you are, and um, it 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 provides an interesting glimpse. So um, into into people's lives, um, a, a, an an intimate look into people's lives. Um, it, a lot of Instagram photos are public, but people don't necessarily think about that because they're sh they, they feel like, you know, the way we thought about it, people are sharing it just with their close friends. So they're showing their, their children, the inside of their homes, um, themselves in a, in, you know, kind of intimate personal moments. And we thought that that was um, a really interesting counterpoint to some of the really scary stories um, that, that we were telling uh, in other parts of, of 68 blocks. Um, so we started a, a kind of a, a months long kind of brainstorming project of like, okay, how are we gonna use Instagram to tell these stories? Um, how, are we gonna, how, how are we gonna bring this out to our readers? Um, and at the same time, we started collecting every single Instagram photo taken in the city of Boston, and we did that via the Instagram API. Um, you know, if, if you ever upload an Instagram photo, you can check off, make this public, and you can check off share my location. And uh, if you do those two things, and it enabled us to, to download them and put them in a database, and, um, uh, and then eventually have um, our editors looking at the photos, and uh, which we did basically every single day for several for several weeks um, for most of the summer and finding ones that that our editors thought helped tell a story um, there was you know there was a, you know a lot a lot of sort of you know is is a real product that we were designing so there was involvement from design from editorial from technology um, and in the end um, I can show you what we ended up with um, uh, it's called Voices of Bowdoin, Geneva, and it's, it's a grid of about um, uh, 25 or 30 Instagram photos um, from about nine different um, people who live in, in, in Bowdoin, Geneva. So there's a number of photos there from, from uh, uh, a number of multiples. Um, and um, to interject here, we had to, as he said, we uh, didn't want to publish people's photos without them knowing, so we went through a very arduous process of contacting each of the people who took Instagram photos and uh, and then asking their permission and those who did give their permission or those we could contact. Um, then we recorded their voices talking about the moments when they took the photo. Right, and that's, I mean, that's how we felt, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of newspapers approached Instagram saying like, hey, let's show everything on a hashtag. Um, we wanted to add context. We wanted to do reporting on on, uh, on on these stories and these people that we found on Instagram, and um, and so that's what we did. Um, 
the process was was you know comment on the photo, say hey, are you willing to talk to a reporter about this, and then have a phone conversation. Um, so I can show you a few of these. My daughter has a tendency to cry when she gets her hair uh, washed. It's my job to keep her smiling while her mom washes her hair. I think that's one of the most important jobs a dad could have in the world. <laughs> this guy right here has been one of my closest friends since I moved in the neighborhood, has looked out for me the whole time. And it was just like a way to show my respect to him. I took this photo in remembrance of my sister this uh, past week. It was her anniversary when she passed away. Those, those flowers in front of her grave are usually her favorite. I thought it looked nice, and that's my mom um, uh, behind the grave. My little sister, she just graduated from New York often, and I was just really proud of her. I don't know, it's an emotional moment because I never thought I'd get to experience that. Basically, I just found it kind of funny that at that particular moment, there was a state police, a Boston police, and a detective. And you know that, that obviously they need to be there if they're there, so it, it's the reality of the neighborhood. We just had gotten Julian a new swimming pool, his first swimming pool. When I put him in it, he started crying. He wanted to get out. He didn't want to stay in at all. So we blew it up and put all the water in it for nothing. <laughs> when you're in the parade, you want everyone to have a good time. So if you see a police officer looking kind of down or looking like too serious, people go over and dance with them. It's just a way to get them involved and make them feel, you know, part of the parade. So there was, I mean, there were a number of qualities about that that, uh, not that, but um, <laughs> about this. Uh, what we ended up with that we really liked. Um, one, we effectively found a way, um, because we took, we grabbed these photos after they had already been taken, then that meant that we, it, they weren't doing it at our direction. And uh, all we did was curate it a little bit and put together what effectively was an organic, unintentional portrait of a community, which we thought was kind of neat. Um, I think in, in some with a lot, a, a, encourage you all to uh, purchase the ebook, um, <laughs> but also if you can like come on to, um, uh, you can still get to the link on our site and play around with all these different things. One of the goals was to do things with many different perspectives and different voices and different tones. Um, do you have the yeah. Scott Lapierre? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this one is almost a, uh, tone poem. We had a photographer who took untraditional photos and a writer who uh, So this is just a 
couple of quick looks. I'm going to turn this back over to Ted. Uh, I want to introduce Maria Kramer. Um, come in late. She was also one of the uh, reporters on the project. Steve, can we show the carry video too? <laughs> the who? Do we have the uh, oh, one yeah. of the um, self-made videos, the, the flip oh, videos? Oh, yeah. We got time for that. So we, we gave um, flip cams to a bunch of kids and had them make, make their own videos. Um, um, and we, we'll show you one of those. Hi, I'm Kaori. Hi, I'm Gianna. And, and this, this is, is our garden. garden. Here we have in our garden, we have different types of fruits and vegetables, if tomato is considered a fruit or vegetable. We have no clue again. This right here is our lettuce. So right here, we have tomatoes. Right here, we have bar Tomato. parsley. Basil. I mean basil. Hi, this is Kayori here, watching my dad prepare chicken for the block party. Hi, I'm very busy right now. OK, the master is preparing his food, so that's enough for right now. Okay, this is the setup for the block party. This is our banner. Ooh, look at this sidewalk chart. Ooh, make sure you video the music. This is Wally Ali. He's a famous legend. What's your favorite thing about the block party? Having something happy and wonderful involving everyone on the street together. <laughs> now we're gonna go check out the music part. Oh, now she's singing. That's good. These people will be wow. That's the master's work. One, two, one, two, one, two. These are the people doing salsa. I just got finished. I wanted to, uh, to thank the, the panel members for sharing their stories, and, uh, and we will get Maria Kramer in here uh, as well. Um, but I think as, as I'm looking at the questions that are coming across on, uh, on Twitter, I will, I will remind people that you can, you can submit questions on Twitter. Also, we do have mics in the room, um, I think, around and about. So um, if you are, there they are wandering around. So if you have a question, uh, you, know, you can certainly raise your hand. We'll try to get to those as well. Um, the ground rules are please wait for a mic. Um, start with your name and where you're from. And a reminder that a question is a question. It's not a statement that goes up at the end. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not a diatribe that ends with, so what do you think of that? So just you know, try to keep the uh, discussion as civil as possible. But uh, there's, there's a number of themes that are emerging on, on Twitter, one of which is you know, we've, been, we've been here for almost an hour now. And, um, and we haven't here at Data Day. And we've probably said the word data twice. <laughs> And no one has talked about percentages and numbers and you know Excel spreadsheets and things beyond sort of a really quick mention at the beginning. Um, obviously, one thing is that this is all sort of I mean this is all data in its own way. But there's 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 qualitative data, and then there's the quantitative data that's also part of this. How do you go about melding those two together in a way to to create the compelling narrative? And does the does what you're collecting is qualitative data? kind of change the way the numbers look or change the way you perceive or approach the numbers in that? You want to take that or should I? I think you should take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think we had a, a basic philosophy that um, uh, starting really at the end of 2011 and, and um, in full force at the beginning of 2012, we had um, a really intensive effort to find uh, numbers of virtually any kind. We wanted to find out what possibly could be out there. We, we wanted to be really creative with, with our thinking. There were some basic things that we really wanted. We wanted um, uh, shootings where they were um, by date. We wanted, uh, we wanted all kinds of quality of life type issues. Um, uh, you know, We spent a lot of time daydreaming about what possibly could be out there, what we could possibly get. 
getting it was uh, another story. It was extremely difficult. Um, but we succeeded with a number of things, and I think we uh, started our visualization ideas with uh, the notion that we didn't want it to seem like numbers. We wanted everything to be a story. There's nothing as concrete as numbers. Um, there is nothing that can tell a story quite like numbers. And uh, we happen to have some brilliant data visualization people uh, working at the globe who spent a lot of time trying to imagine how we could present these things in ways that were simple and uh, easy to look at and in a way that would be engaging and that would make you, uh, that would draw you in like, just like what we try to do with words or with photographs. Um, I just wanted to jump on that on the numbers thing. You talked about how difficult it was to get them. So when you want to tell a story like the one we told, you want to concentrate on you know areas where there's a lot of 911 calls, where there's a lot of shootings, where there's a lot of homicides. But you you know that information is not just out there. It's not you can't just Google it and find it. Um, there were a lot of sort of old-fashioned you know reporting ways that we had to get that information. The Freedom of Information Act requests, um, and then when we filed those, hounding the agencies that we sent these FOIAs to, like. Boston Police Department and City Hall, getting these numbers was was taxing. We had to call, we had to you know set up meetings. It was um, it, you know the, the reason that I'm bringing this up is because I think there's an assumption that numbers are just sort of available and it's just a matter of a few keystrokes and finding them. When really it was you know pounding the pavement, harassing you know public officials for you know for information that was technically public, but sometimes you need to gently prod them to remind them of that and sometimes not so gently. And the other issue too was the boundaries for our Very neighborhoods, um, for the neighborhood. So it's six, eight blocks, it's Bowdoin, Geneva, but who deems it Bowdoin, Geneva and where those boundary lines um, lay is not as simple as it sounds. Um, a lot of this you hear comes from police designations, from what used to be a hot spot. It's intersecting um, zip codes, and so when you would go to these various agencies and say, um, I want all of your information on the Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood, that's not really the way that a lot of uh, public agencies keep their information. Like, I harass the school department. And um, that's just not how they, that's just not how their information is stored. It's not stored by neighborhood names. And Bowdoin Geneva as a neighborhood encompasses, um, is, is, has different boundaries for different public agencies. The police department has one set of boundaries. Um, public works has one set of boundaries. The school system has no boundaries. And so we had to, not for Bowdoin Geneva. Um, and so we essentially had to give them, and this is where the data dudes come in, um, our like our own map. That was like geo, like that was geo bounded, and then through lots of um, relationship building, they essentially created the data that we needed. Because public institutions, public, they don't have to create create spreadsheets for us. They're not ob they're not obligated to kind of create information for you. And by creating, it was a matter of getting all of these various databases to talk to each other in such a way that it could give us the information that we needed for this arbitrary set of boundaries that we presented to them and said, I want to know dropout information. I want to know free and reduced lunch. I want to know <clears throat> test scores. Um, I want to know attendance rates. I want to know um, graduation rates for the students in this neighborhood. And then it becomes, again, with the negotiation for access. Because, well, there, there aren't that many kids that attend public schools in that area as you think. So then it becomes, well, we can't give you this because it falls out of some this statistical liar. And theoretically, you might be able to identify the five students in these 68 blocks who fit this parameter. So we can't get. So it was this constant kind of mixing and melding our um, our, our, our vision with the reality of what we were going to get. And so, I mean, just to get the school's data took, I mean, it took like almost a year. Uh, just, just, just in terms of, of when we put in our request, what was an actuality, what we were able to do, meeting, and because I don't speak data as fluently as our data dudes, <laughs> getting them in the same room um, with the district's data guys. And so it was, it was a very cumbersome process. It was very challenging, but, too, because we were asking for a very, small section of the city. And normally these 
the way they collect data is by census tracts or zip codes and our neighborhood uh, I think there were three or four different zip codes. It's at the edge of uh, the census tract. I think it includes one uh, complete census tract and a bunch of different other ones, parts of each. And so people were, I think initially were telling us, we met a lot of resistance because they were saying it's too small and you won't get a complete picture by drilling down that that small. And, and so to even get a um, a, a, a data specialist on the phone to explain to us initially how can we do this? You know, how can we uh, look at this one pocket of the city and get the data that we need for this city was a challenge all of its own. It took us months to even get people on the phone because I, I think there was the sense that it couldn't be done really. So to follow up to that, uh, one of the, the organizations under the Boston Police Department is Operation Homefront. Uh, Homefront is Boston police officers with ministers, and what they do is get references from the schools of problem situations, and then one night a week or two nights a week, a clergyman, a woman, and two police officers will visit those families. So the idea came up about why not visit kids who have dropped out of school? Your challenge was easier than ours. <laughs> we had to, I, I happen to work with them, so they had to submit the list of the specific streets to the Boston School Department. And then it had to go through, I don't know how many different levels before there was finally a big meeting. And so Operation Homefront was given a list and so we started visiting dropouts. The list was a disaster. Some of them were in college, some of them had switched schools. One of the kids on the list had hung himself in school and he was listed as a dropout. Schools, in my opinion, and this is off, I guess, that's where a lot can be done to prevent violence, you know, they can tell you, you people know more than I do about third, fourth graders, there's a tip off there. Let's deal with it then. Well, good luck, in my opinion, dealing with the Boston School Department. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, do, I did want to get to the questions from the audience, too. I'm not sure where the, um, go ahead. Right in front here. Are you going to hold it? I'm Martha Sandler. Hi. I'm from On the Rise, which is a a day program in Cambridge for homeless women. And we uh, are also interested in telling stories about the women in our programs and supporting it with data. But we also have a confidential relationship with them and a responsibility to our relationships with them that I think sort of resonates with what you were talking about in living in the neighborhood and getting to know people. And sometimes the stories that we might want to tell are not necessarily the stories that they would choose to tell about themselves. And I wondered if you had to deal with that in your writing and if the people that you formed these relationships had an opportunity to say, to edit, basically to say, no, I, I don't, you know, I said that when you were a fly on the wall. Um, I forgot you were in the room. It was that great moment for you. And, and now I realize I, I don't want you to put that in my story. If you could talk about that. Talk. Um, so well, yeah, a lot of those moments happened. And so, um, so like I said, I, I spent the summer with um, Teresa Johnson. And at the beginning when we first started, there was a lot of she would say something or something would happen and she would look at me and say, I don't know that I want that in the newspaper. I, I don't know that I want that in the newspaper. And so um, we were in a kitchen one day and I said, Teresa, I know I'm asking a lot from you. You don't know me that well, but I'm asking that you trust me. I'm asking that you trust me with your story and that you put it all on the table and you trust me to pick up the relevant pieces at the end. I said, because what seems like such a huge event in your life now, in September, October, when this thing is coming together, it may not it, it may not even make it on the table. It may not be something that is that is so huge. So I, I'm asking a lot. Trust me. Trust me to pick up the relevant pieces. 
Um, and I said, I, I promise you, and this, and, and, and this is a bit of a departure from how we normally operate, but because we did spend so much time with people, I felt, and I think we all felt, it was very important for them to not be surprised by what was gonna be in the paper. So I said, trust me, not a word is going to go into the newspaper that you are surprised by. You'll know it. And so after, she, she, she gave me this look and she folded her arms and she said, okay. And from then on, it was just everything was on the record and she knew. And when it was said and done, I sat in that same kitchen with her and I read to her everything. I read every word to her. And she didn't have one problem with anything I picked up. Because as you begin to form these relationships with people, you realize there is a way to tell people's stories while still respecting that sense of privacy that they have, but still letting them know these are, um, these are very integral moments that helped create your story and helped propel you forward and help make you who you are. And we want to be honest and authentic to that. But there's always, I feel there's always a way to do it um, that's not sensational, that's not, um, that, that they can be proud of. Because at the end of the day, they have to look at themselves in the mirror. And th there were some things that just, I didn't pick up from the table because it just wasn't, they were great, like, all oh, that would be great. But it was just kind of a sensational, salacious detail that you could get across that same message without kind of violating that sense of privacy. So it's, it's a really kind of um, intense conversation to have up front, but I think before you start telling the stories, you have the honest conversation and then you just let them know at the end. You don't get to edit it, but you can be surprised by it and I'm sure we can reach some sort of happy medium to where the end result is something that you're, that you're gonna that she'll be happy with, and she was. She was very honored and happy with, with the way it came about. Um, I was, I'm just gonna ask something briefly because I know there are a lot of questions. You know, I'm the one that stalked Father Doc here, and, uh, <laughs> and one of the most terrifying things, and I stalked Tal, <laughs> and one of the most terrifying things about this story was the end, when I knew it was gonna be published, and I was gonna have to tell Father Doc, and I was gonna have to tell Tal what was in it. And I was so scared because the last thing I wanted was for them to say, no, 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 you can't use that, you can't use that. But I also knew that, you know, I had made the agreement with them, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna be writing about. And so I just was very honest with both of them. I read them everything. And I think, you know, Tal said, oh, that's not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Mm. You know, so for all my worrying, it was fine. And Father Doc, I think, just wanted one word changed. <laughs> that was basically it. Well, you know, the Globe and the Catholic Church have not always had a happy... You think she was scared. Uh, I said, what have I got myself into? I think we were all on edge, but, you know, we were dealing with a lot of people who... What we were most afraid of is, or worried about, is what's going to happen when this, is all, when this is published? You know, what's going to happen to the people whose lives we've uh, exposed and who allowed us in our, in our lives. And there were people who had real concerns, like Tal. People were trying to kill him. And, um, and so we wanted to be able to tell that story about an effort to save this young man and give him a job um, without also jeopardizing his life. And there, there, are, there are things you can do and the things we did do as a, as a newspaper to ensure that we didn't sort of out this guy, we didn't put his name out. We, put the, I think we had one picture, we didn't, we had one picture we didn't we show his, his picture, face. face and, and, and we, we showed it to him too. Yeah, and we showed it to him because we, we wanted to ensure that we were, I think, I think the people who are, uh, uh, who, allow, who allow us to document them um, also have an interest in and getting their stories out too. So I guess one of my things to you would be like, you, if you have someone who wants her story out um, and there are ways you can work around sort of. I feel like a lot of the people ultimately yeah. did it because out of some sense of the greater good yeah. that we had. I, I feel like you might find the same thing that um, people are inherently private. They have a, all of us have a face that we show to the world and another one that's in the privacy of our house, you know, when we pick our nose. And um, nobody wants that exposed, so it's an uncomfortable thing at first, but when people understand that their stories are powerful and help show the world something important, um, I think you would be surprised at how often um, that they want to do something for that. 
I kind of want to pick up on, on some of this thread right here with another, it's another kind of combined line of questions from, from Twitter where I'm seeing first there's, there's, there's some folks saying, well, what took you so long? Which is an understandable thing. <laughs> Second, there's, there's sort of this level of, okay, that's great, but no matter how long you spend there, I mean, you were there for months, but, but it's still, it's an extended snapshot. So, okay, what took you so long? What are you gonna do now? And then the third piece is a little bit of a, you know, ultimately this series was kind of preceded by the violence in the community. So even though the series itself is designed to get beyond the portrayal of Bowdoin Geneva as a violent community, it's still kind of based around that frame. And how do you change that over time? And how do, you know, I mean, because I'm assuming there's people in the community who say, you know, yeah, you're, st you're still talking about how violent it is, and it's still such a wonderful place. How do you how do you change that frame over time, and how do you use the the qualitative and the quantitative to be able to make that happen? Uh, if I leave out a part, um, remind me. Uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, what took us so long, I mean, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know how to answer it. Uh, it's money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the reality, I mean, there are a lot of factors, but uh, the reality is that um, uh, projects like this are extremely expensive. And they, um, uh, you know, you don't, you don't do anything like this without a lot of people being on board. And just because the reality of any institution, it, uh, it sort of took a number of forces, including uh, Jen Peter, our Metro editor, who was uh, deeply committed to it. Um, our editor at the time, Martin Barron, uh, who saw it as a great public service and was willing to spend the money even at a time when the newspaper was, and the newspaper industry in general was uh, uh, really struggling. Um, uh, you know, we, we entered this thing knowing that a summer, a year, two years, five years, there is no amount of time that isn't finite. And there is no way that we can ever occupy any particular place or do anything uh, indefinitely. So we knew that that was like something that, uh, that we would grapple with. But what we thought that we could do is establish a base of reporting, establish um, an intimacy with the neighborhood that would provide complexity and nuance, frankly, in a way that we have not done for any other neighborhood in Boston. Um, now, there's been, we're making up for a lot of lost time, and what we hope is that this is the beginning of a conversation then in that community in which uh, we cover things with more frequency. Um, we've had a number of stories since then that uh, are of a kind and quality that we have never had before, and we're continuing with that kind of coverage. The last question, which seems to me is, uh, it's been a controversial one. We've taken a lot of heat about it from some people. Um, there, in some ways, it's hard to define what this project is. By putting so much attention on it, by putting so much attention on a particular neighborhood, are we depicting the neighborhood as a whole? Are we presenting to the world what this neighbor, what the reality of this neighborhood is? And the answer, of course, is a little bit yes. But we went into it because there is violence there. And I think it's indisputable. We didn't go there because we wanted to ignore the violence. We went there because we wanted to understand the violence. Mm -hmm. And by understanding it, we hope, and by shedding light on it and looking at it with, in an unflinching, um, unpredisposed way, we thought that as journalists do, that like by putting sunlight on something that smart minds would find ways to, smart minds and dedicated minds, Doc Conway here and many others, who uh, are able to use that and or use the attention that it might bring to, uh, to find solutions. Great. I wanted to get, try to get one more question from the audience before, uh, and I don't know who already has a microphone. Take you from the back there. Good morning. My name is Sarah Flint. I'm with the organization Mothers for Justice and Equality, which is a um, group of mothers and victims of homicide. I myself has lost my son to um, violence. My question is, um, all this data has been collected, 
as the person asked um, from the online, what is this data? What are you going to do with this data? You know, um, also I want to thank the Boston Foundation for, think, um, for um, having confidence in our organization and the globe. When my son was um, murdered, there was an article done on him and was put in the magazine section. I've never been able to thank you. I want to thank you for um, giving um, a story to my son's name. So. Thank you so much. That's, um, I'm sorry for your loss. There's nothing that can ever compensate for that. Um, what do we do with the data? Well, um, we put some of it in the best way that we, we could present it here. There's a lot sitting in cardboard boxes and, uh, <laughs> and CDs in a room where, that we called the cave because it was dark and cold. Um, uh, you know, there's also, if you want it, you can have it. <laughs> um, we've, uh, at, at Globe Lab, we have, a, um, we try to build partnerships with um, academic organizations in Boston um, and uh, our main data journalist uh, in the newsroom, Matt Carroll, has um, pretty carefully curated um, the data that we've been able to digitize. Um, and we've kind of let it be known that that, that, that that exists and we're trying to find ways, trying to find groups at, at, at Northeastern, at Harvard, MRT, MIT, who are w willing to work with that data, data scientists, um, to, to do research on it um, because it was pretty hard to get and I, I think it has a lot of value. So, so we are actually, actually actively trying to find, uh, as part of Globe Lab, trying to find people who would be interested in doing research with it. Um, so if you're interested in it, please approach me afterwards. <laughs> Great. And um, you know, one, thing, one thing that I've learned in my time at the Boston Foundation is no meeting is ever complete without a question from, uh, from Charlotte Kahn. <laughs> so I know. <laughs> Um. Yeah, we were talking earlier about using data to drive public policy, and right now, the people in the Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood are being disproportionately affected by a lot of the cuts that are happening at the state level and the federal level. And I just wonder if the Globe, which has many different departments, including editorial, is actually you know, looking at the stories that you've told from your point of view and drawing conclusions and possibly thinking about going back to look at the impact of cuts in Head Start, early intervention, um, you know, maybe food stamps, um, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of education. You know, you've made these, you've created these relationships and this question already came up, so now what? And um, I just think that there, you know, there are other stories to tell and there's a way to have an impact. Sounds like a uh, good story. It should go. Yeah, it's a good follow question up. mark? I might say you just failed the question statement thing. Yeah. But. She gets a pass. Exactly. <laughs> I think that that's, the, that, you know, what you just said, that those are great story ideas right there. You know, you have data and data, when you look at it carefully, that's where you find stories and the cuts, that's, a, you know, that's a very newsworthy way of going back into the neighborhood and seeing, you know, how the lives that we covered last year, you know, have been affected now. That's just a great story idea. Mm -hmm. Good Could editing. we have you come to the meeting? <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> um, I, you know, unfortunately, as, as always happens with these things, the time uh, catches up with you quickly. Um, so I, I, before we wrap up, though, I'd, I'd love to say, you know, if the, first of all, say thank you to all the members of the panel for, uh, for coming here today. But also... Um, <laughs> give you a chance for, for your final thoughts on, on kind of what this process has meant or um, where you sort of hope to see it go from here, if there's other, other points that you wanted to add. I, so I actually just wanted to piggyback on, so I, I, will, I will use this as my closing statement, I guess. Um, <laughs> in addition to piggybacking off, off of a question that came from the online, I think that had to do with um, essentially changing the narrative and how do we get away from the violence framework. And since this is data days, I think it's important to bring up the numbers because we're there because the numbers are staggering. And so it's very hard to get away from a narrative of violence when you still have a disproportionate 
uh, number of shootings and violent incidents happening within a specific neighborhood. And so we don't want to continue to go to a neighborhood just to talk about the violence. And that's not why we were there, but we also can't ignore it. And so when you stand on the foundation of some very staggering numbers, you, you can't ignore that. We, we would not be doing our job if we ignored those numbers. And so when those numbers start to change, we can begin to change some of the frameworks in which we tell the story. But we also told it from a frame of not just telling the story of violence, but telling the story of people who live in a neighborhood that happens to have a disproportionate amount of violence. So it's not just the way we told it, it's also the way people have perceived it on some level. And this is not a passing of the buck thing, but I know I set out, and I know quite a few of my colleagues, I think all of us did, we set out to tell the stories of people. And people are complex, and issues are complex. Nothing is simple. And so in order to change that narrative, we need to start changing some of these very hard, and hard facts that violence persists in this neighborhood at a disproportionate level. That's not all that's there. And we were trying our best to tell the full picture that that's it, yes, it's here, but that's not everything. So, I mean, that's a question we get a lot, and I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And I believe you're doing a story uh, soon on um, something that has nothing to do with violence. So nothing to do with violence, out of the neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's a follow-up, a more in-depth story that has to do with the Dorchester Food Co-op and um, its designation in the city and its efforts to, to be built and kind of where that means for the city and some of the things that are happening. And um, so, I mean, not everything is about violence, but when it's there, you can't ignore it either. I mean, since the, since the series, you know, we've been in that neighborhood doing a lot of stories. I've done stories about Boy Scouts, you know, you know, increasing in the inner city, and the biggest pack is from Bowdoin, Geneva. And I've told stories about health issues, and, and we're in that neighborhood, and we're telling those stories, and we're, we're you know, it's not, we don't have the 68 block label, but we haven't forgotten the people that are there, and we're still covering it intensely. Great. I think on that note, we'll call it a, uh, we'll call it a panel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.